Well, uh, it's good to be with you uh, once again, and I would like to extend my thanks to, to Rachel, to Sandra, uh, to Hannah uh, for their uh, services uh, up front, uh, also to Jason behind the camera, uh, and Isaac playing a, a similar role uh, as well. Thank you so much uh, for your involvement uh, in the service. Well, before uh, we do look at uh, Ephesians chapter three, I'm just going to read a, a verse or two from the second letter of John, where uh, he writes, and this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is a commandment, just as you heard it from the beginning. You must walk uh, in it. Well, something rather strange happened to me at the ear, nose and throat unit at St. Mary's Hospital this week. What was strange was that I was remembered. Somebody actually remembered me from the last time that I was there. And this genuinely surprised me. I've always regarded myself as kind of easily forgettable and pretty nondescript, uh, to be honest. In fact, I'm, excuse me, I'm often being mistaken for other people. Uh, whilst on the mainland, I was mistaken for my local MP. I was mistaken for a prisoner on license twice. I mean, that's a bit of a come down, isn't it, really? I mean, being mistaken for your local MP. But there we are. I'm very much aware that I seem to be quite nondescript and I'm easily forgettable. So I'm genuinely surprised when, uh, after meeting somebody again after, uh, after nine months, that they kind of remember me uh, at all. Uh, but James, uh, the person who was shining his torch uh, into my ears, uh, remembered me straight away. Uh, and he said to the receptionist, ah, oh, that's the boxing vicar. At which point I think the opinions, the, the receptionist opinion of me was revised downwards uh, straight away. And then uh, once uh, in the cubicle, as he was once again shining his torch uh, into my ears, that's the way for my eyes to light up, by the way. Uh, he relayed back to me uh, the story that I'd shared with him uh, nine months ago and in some detail. And it was the story about how uh, Jason had been nearly killed in an attack in Newport along with his friend, as they had successfully uh, rescued a woman from being uh, attacked. And I'd shared um, with, uh, with James, um, the, the, the consultant at the hospital, about how uh, Jason and his friend were, did admirably. They were just really absolutely fantastic and were able to forgive the attacker who was caught and who didn't meet with them and apologize. But for me, how I had found it much much more difficult to get to a place where I could uh, forgive this person. Very, very difficult indeed, even though I knew and taught and believed that it was a command in scripture to forgive. And also, as we've just seen from 2 John, that God's love and his commandments belong together and should not in any way be separated. So the story that I had told uh, uh, James, this consultant, um, in no way elevated me at all. In fact, I was sharing with him how shocked I was that despite believing in uh, forgiveness and preaching and teaching it, that I had needed other people uh, to help me. I was nevertheless surprised, it was nine months, that he had remembered this story and surprised that he had remembered uh, me at all. But he explained why. He said to me, he said, it's so rare to hear stories of how somebody who could have taken retribution, and I most certainly could have done, was nevertheless able to forgive. And that comment kind of really struck me. And I wonder if uh, as Christians, we sometimes take the good news of the gospel a bit for granted. And we can kind of forget, or perhaps we're even quite surprised that when we present a genuine good news story about how love has won, that that can actually impact somebody uh, outside, as it were, of the new community much more dramatically than perhaps we have realised. In other words, there is a society out there, actually on our own front doorstep, that is desperate to hear true stories of genuine hope and of genuine love winning over hate, not just as inspirational quotes on Facebook and all of that, but stories of where it was actually proven to be uh, possible, however difficult. Well, this, of course, then brings us to Paul, because Paul believes in hope in shed loads, and he practices hope. I mean, I know I keep repeating it uh, each time, 
Uh, but um, let's not forget, just in case you have forgotten me from last Sunday, I'm Adrian, by the way, um, that Paul, in dictating Ephesians, is in prison. Paul spent a lot of his time uh, in prison, but it's really easy to forget that because his letters, certainly Ephesians, Colossians and Romans in particular, are full of hope. They're bright. They're positive, even though he is in a prison. Ironically, by the way, he's in prison for something he hasn't done. Uh, he was convicted of um, allowing a Greek, uh, uh, Trophimus actually, through the dividing wall between uh, Gentiles and Jews in the temple, and Paul hadn't actually done that. So Paul is in prison for something that he hadn't done. And by the way, you may be watching this this morning and you're in prison for something that you haven't done. But Paul is full of hope. Why? Because his faith, his hope, and his love is in Jesus. It's a true little story, uh, perhaps not quite so inspirational, of uh, a man who said to his friend, um, how are you? And his friend said, well, fine, under the circumstances. And the person said, well, what are you doing under the circumstances? Don't you really hate it when somebody comes out with a comment like that? Nevertheless, the challenge was valid. It does seem to be possible, absolutely not easy, but it seems to be possible to be able to rise above circumstances, however difficult they are. Whether you're in prison, perhaps for something that you haven't done, or perhaps uh, needing to uh, forgive somebody when you'd much rather kind of prefer to do something else uh, to them. Well, let's now focus in on uh, Ephesians uh, chapter three. I'd love to say that Paul doesn't do things by halves. Actually, he does, which is kind of a, a little bit annoying, really, because in each of the chapters, one, two, three, um, they are in two halves. Uh, and so what we're going to do is to look at the first half here of uh, chapter three. Also, just a reminder that this is a round robin letter. This is not a letter addressed to one church. By the way, uh, Ephesians or Ephesus is not in the original uh, document. That was, added, that was actually added in, in the second century. This is a letter that's going around churches uh, in uh, Asia Minor. And for that reason, the Apostle Paul um, dictates the letter, writing just a little bit, but mainly dictating. But he's dealing with themes that are very, very broad brushstroke because it's this kind of round uh, robin letter. And for this reason, he is speaking to Jews and Gentiles. He's not speaking to one little local church, such as Corinth, which is virtually all Gentiles. He's not speaking to one church in Jerusalem, which would have been all Jews. He's speaking to a whole range of uh, churches, and therefore he's dealing with the challenges of Jews and Gentiles. And actually the specific challenge of Jew and Gentile Christian learning to cohabit uh, together which was frankly a massive challenge. So Ephesians is written to both Jews and to Gentiles. A Gentile, by the way, is anybody who is not a Jew. In Paul's time, they would, have been, they would only just be emerging from a very pagan uh, background. But this does explain though why at certain points in the letter, Paul will sometimes speak more to Jews than to Gentiles. And at other points in his letter, he will speak more to Gentiles than to Jews. And in the first half of chapter three, he is speaking primarily to the Gentiles. And this is why he uses phrases like mystery and revelation. Uh, if you're a pagan at the time, you would know absolutely a number of mystery religions. That's what they were called. Uh, and these would be very small, very exclusive groups and they would pride themselves on a secret knowledge. They did not proclaim this knowledge uh, abroad. Uh, they did not advertise for new followers. They kept themselves very, very much to themselves and prided themselves on their secret knowledge. One such group, by the way, which nearly destroyed the early church were the uh, Decetists, but there were others uh, as well. And what Paul wants to say to the Gentiles, it's not really a challenge to the Jews, what he wants to say to the Gentiles in this first half of this letter is that this mystery 
is Jesus. The true mystery religion has been revealed in and through Jesus. And this is why he will also say, particularly at the end of uh, a chapter 3, and he really emphasised it in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, by the way, that knowledge is important, but love is much more important. And the Apostle Paul is having a bit of a dig at these mystery religions that are very exclusive, they keep themselves to themselves, they don't advertise their whereabouts at all, and pride themselves on their secret uh, knowledge. It's where we get the word gnosis, by the way, gnosis, diagnosis. And this is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, we know in part what's more important is that we are loved uh, by uh, Jesus. There's just a bit of a challenge here actually for all of us, uh, whether we're Jew or Gentile, that biblical knowledge is important, but what's more important is that Jesus has been revealed to us and we have responded to his love, which is utterly uh, beyond measure. Be very careful in your Christian walk that you don't replace love with knowledge. That's quite an easy shift to make as life progresses. Always be sure that what's most important to you is the love of Jesus. And because of that, you want to learn more about him. Because of that, you want to go to uh, his uh, word. We shouldn't be so surprised, of course, that the Apostle Paul is overwhelmed about the revelation of Jesus. Because, of course, uh, there was a time when he was Saul and uh, he was on the Damascus Road. And Jesus revealed himself to him in a vision. Uh, and Saul, of course, was blinded uh, for three days. Uh, we do believe, by the way, that um, Paul um, subsequently had a problem with, uh, with myopia. Um, we, we do think that Paul's thorn in the flesh may well have been a short-sightedness. Um, it's something I've just struggled a little bit here. Uh, I don't think I'm the only one who struggles with it, by the way. Um, I remember there was a visitor who came to Castlehof who um, actually thought that uh, Rachel was my daughter. Well, hey, thanks for that one. Um, I was really rather tempted to say to the man, you know, you really should have, you really should go to Specsavers, but he might have said, well, I just did. So, so, so there we are. But it does seem to be that the Apostle Paul struggled with his eyes. See how I write my name with a large hand, uh, he says. In chapter three, I, I write a few words. He is struggling uh, with his eyes out. And this may well be due to the fact that on the Damascus Road, Jesus reveals himself to him. He is blinded uh, for a few days, actually. And he is really shocked that this community of Christians that he is trying to kill, that's what he's seeking to do uh, at the time. There were two schools of Pharisees and one school took up the dagger against what they believe are opponents of God, and Paul was, uh, Saul, sorry, at the time, was of that particular school. And Jesus reveals himself to him uh, and said, this community that you think are dishonoring the name of God, actually, you know, when you're hurting them, uh, you're hurting me. So this feeds through all of uh, the Apostle Paul's subsequent writings, this revelation of who Jesus is. He's wonderful, he's marvellous, he's amazing, and his love is without measure. He even loves somebody like Saul, who is out to kill the disciples uh, of uh, Jesus. You know, it's interesting because in the Bible, Saul, or, the, or Paul, as he would become, of course, wasn't the only murderer uh, that God uh, used. And um, if you are in prison watching this this morning, and you are guilty of murder, please do not think for one moment that God has given up on you. And you can come to God in genuine repentance, and God can give you a new life. There may just be somebody who kind of needs to hear that. Or perhaps you're watching this this morning, and you're not guilty of murder, but you've done something pretty bad in your life. I can assure you, you are not beyond the pale, as it were, of the love of Jesus, which is utterly uh, beyond measure. King David uh, was a murderer. 
adulterer as well. Um, pretty horrible character, to be honest, much of the time. Uh, but God was able to use him because David had a repentant heart. I remember it was many years ago, um, there was a church looking for a minister. And they decided to go a slightly different route. And they thought they'd ask some rather pretentious questions. And the question that they wanted to know of every applicant was, are you a David? Tell us why you think you're a David. And I thought, this is a lot of pretentious nonsense, but I'll, I'll answer the question anyway. And I just wrote, well, I'm not a murderous adulterer. But apart from that, I think I do have some qualities that may be linked to David. I got shortlisted. <laughs> I got shortlisted down from 500 <laughs> to about 20, um, but I decided not to take uh, the offer up because there's only so much stupidity that I can cope with. So there we are. Paul is thoroughly amazed that this mystery is Jesus, that Jesus has revealed himself to. And what really excites Paul is that not only, as he says here, not only have um, the Gentiles now become part of, added to uh, the community uh, of faith, it's more than that. And um, the idea that Gentiles could become Christians is actually prophesied in the Old Testament. That, in a sense, is not the revelation. The revelation is, says Paul, that we are fellow heirs. That we who are not Jews have equal standing, equal status, in this new community of faith. Do you remember King Julian from Madagascar 2? Isn't that an absolutely fantastic film? Do you remember that one time when King Julian says, it's nothing personal, we're just better than you? Uh, and what Paul is saying to the Gentiles here is, you are part of a new community. You haven't just been kind of let in, just as long as you keep quiet and, you know, don't, you know, that don't defile the rest of us, that there is a new community here which is utterly classless because of God's amazing love, because of the revelation of Jesus. We are all truly equal. And Paul is amazed by this himself, even though, as it were, he's a Jew. Paul, as I am, Paul was struck by how nondescript he was. In fact, we learn from his letter to the church at Corinth that several other people thought he was pretty nondescript as well. There is a pun on his name uh, in verse 8 here, when Paul describes himself as the very least. He's using a Greek word meaning small, and he's using, and that word is linked to uh, his name. Uh, and um, also, um, apparently, according to tradition, he had a crooked nose. So thankfully, I'm not, in, I'm not like that uh, at all. Uh, or indeed with regard to his height. But for both Paul uh, and I, this issue of being nondescript matters not one whit when you are saturated in the love of God and you are part of this new community of faith. Now, this is the new community, says Paul, that reaches out to the fragmented community outside. This is the exciting new community which impacts those outside sometimes much more than we are realizing. And then he says, and this I think is really quite uh, exciting, that uh, what God is doing through his church, and notice how the Apostle Paul has a very high opinion of the church, and I do wish that we would grasp that high opinion of the church ourselves. What Paul is saying is, is that the church in its rich variety is now being made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Now, uh, there are two groups here, uh, possibly three, but I'll pick that one up another time. The ruler of the air, Satan's forces, Satan's angels, so that the, this new community is being made manifest to them. But it could also include all angels, uh, good angels as well, uh, if you like. I wonder if you've thought I haven't thought about this until recently, um, although I've done quite a lot of study on angels, by the way, and I've done quite a lot of teaching on it uh, in, in different places, that as God is working and developing his church, his new community, he, through us, is teaching angels about himself. I think that's pretty amazing. 
Elsewhere, by the way, and I think it's uh, in 1 Corinthians, I'm not quite sure, Paul will say that sometimes angels join us during our praise and worship, and we are not aware of it. And of course, you will be aware um, of the text where Paul says that sometimes we have entertained angels unawares. Um, Billy Graham in his younger days wrote a really good book on angels. It's still in print and I would recommend it uh, to you. But he makes one mistake in the book. He says in his book that I've never seen an angel. And the reality, of course, is he doesn't know whether or not uh, he has seen an angel. So, says Paul, this fantastic new life and love that has been revealed to us through Jesus is now being used, is now the centre of this new community of which we are a part and of which we are playing our part, not least through obeying God's commands and seeing that as an intrinsic part of his love, not as an optional extra uh, outside of it. And as this new community is being built up, we are teaching angels, both of those, as it were, on the dark side and those, as it were, uh, on the good side uh, as well. And I sometimes wonder how God's angels are uh, thinking. I sometimes wonder what they think of us. You know? So this is God's plan to establish his kingdom across the whole world. And they look at us and they go, really? <laughs> So what's plan B then, I wonder? I hope that more often than not, the angels are looking at us, sometimes joining in praise and worship with us, socially distanced, of course, and are saying, isn't this a fantastic, wonderful expression of the immeasurable love of God? We live in a fragmented society. It's going to get worse in the, in, in the years ahead. It's going to get much worse. It's not going to get a, a, any better except it could get better if we took on board more and more of the revelation of Jesus and his love and truly become this uh, new community. I could go on about uh, this first half of Ephesians chapter 3 uh, forever. You'll be pleased to know uh, that I won't uh, and I'll move on to the, to the second half uh, and I'll deal with this much more briefly where Paul prays for the readers or hearers of this uh, gospel, which now, of course, he's speaking to Jews and Gentiles as well. Well, what does he pray for? He prays for power through the Holy Spirit. How many of us are living Christian lives of power? Not just obedience, not just service, but actual power as well. Paul, uh, in verse 18 here, wants all saints to experience this uh, power. He wants all saints to get to the place of the pure shores of the kingdom of God uh, and find a place that they can call uh, their uh, home. And why, once again? Well, I guess just backtracking to the first half where Paul writes, that in Christ Jesus, we can have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him. So together, as Jews and Gentiles, together, we can have power in uh, the Holy Spirit and we can have this access to our Father God. Uh, you probably know the story of the Confederate soldier, a couple of centuries back, of course, who wanted to speak to the President of the United States. And of course, he wasn't going, he wasn't going to be let inside the White House at all. So he just waited outside the gate. And a little boy came up to him and said, what are you doing? And so I said, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to speak to the President, but you know, the guards won't let me through the gate. Just a soldier, really. And the boy said, follow me. And the soldier smiled at the boldness and confidence of this little child who had just passed him on the street, decided to play along. To his amazement, when the boy approached the gate with a soldier next to him, the gate was opened and the guard let the little boy in and therefore let the Confederate soldier in. To his absolute amazement, the Confederate soldiers carried on walking, walking, and each door opened for the little boy. Finally, to his amazement, the Confederate soldier found himself 
literally in the presence of uh, Abraham Lincoln. And the little boy looked at Abraham Lincoln and said, Dad, I don't know why, but this guy here wants to have a word with you. We can have access to our loving Heavenly Father because of the revelation that uh, is in uh, Jesus Christ. And then in verse 20, because of all of this, we can accomplish far more than all we can ask or imagine. Isn't that a fantastic truth? I mean, isn't it really quite challenging that as an individual Christian, as a church community, all that we imagine we could achieve for God, we can actually do more than that. I mean, doing perhaps just not to get gripped by this uh, all uh, over uh, again. Uh, we live in a society which is not doing fine under the circumstances. We live in a society that is not rising above circumstances. Let's reveal Jesus to them. Let's reveal the mystery to them. Because we are fellow heirs. And like faith and like hope, love wins. Amen.